and just listening to you talk reminded me why I've enjoyed meeting you once every five years over the last 15 years. <laughs> um, and I think, for me, um, it makes explicit, you know, one, I, one of the difficult things that we're all engaged in in the next three years is trying to interact with different ways of knowing. Um, uh, and I, the talk I'm going to give is so different that it kind of struck me that clearly I think differently than James does. But at the same time, the challenge of Coglovo is really to try and inform some very specific problems that you're all going to be working on for your PhDs and that we're going to be working with, with other ways of knowing that maybe not only inform your own practice, but help uh, come up with maybe some innovative, uh, creative uh, ways of, of solving those problems. Um, the other thing that I just wanted, that I, just listening to James, I wanted to mention um, a colleague of mine is a, a physiologist called Robert Ruth Bernstein. Um, if you don't know his work, uh, it's really interesting at the moment. He's been studying the habits of successful scientists and engineers outside of their work environment. Um, and he has compared the habits of those successful scientists and engineers with habits of less successful scientists and engineers. <laughs> And it's actually slightly <coughs> frightening. Um, you probably know what all of you know of uh, the famous physicist Feynman, who's probably more known for his drumming than his physics, uh, actually on the planet. Um, it turns out that there are a number of California physicists who were amazing surfers, because they grew up in California in the 1970s. Um, and one of the things that Robert Ruth Bernstein discovered in reading their diaries and their letters is that these successful scientists and engineers considered their avocations, the things they did outside of work, as crucial parts of their creative practice. Um, so when I was a PhD student, I was a disco dancer. <laughs> um, I used to think that was just what I did for relaxation. But actually, probably what helped me advance in my own scientific career. And so, I think as you work on your PhDs, um, think about what you do outside of the walls of this university uh, as part of how you problem solve. Um, and um, now it turns out some of those scientists and engineers took drugs. I don't recommend that necessarily <laughs> as a, a creative stimulant uh, because there are lots of drunk scientists that have no good ideas, uh, as you probably know. So it's, it's not simple. Um, but those practices, I think, um, embodied practices that um, James was talking about, um, we should not just put on, on the, the side of what we do for recreation. It's really part of uh, our uh, creative activity. Um, what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to restart uh, my, the slides from yesterday, which I kind of rushed through. Rushed through. Um, um, but the focus of what I'm going to talk about is enabling new forms of collaboration between science engineering, the arts, design, and humanities. And obviously in this room, we have people whose professional practices falls into those uh, kinds of different categories. Um, and it's, I think it's an exciting time because a lot of people like this group are working on this kind of a problem, um, and it's not just driven by government funding. <laughs> uh, it's, it's also driven by pleasure, I think, so I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so um, I'll start, as I said, I'll start again with the slides that I gave yesterday, which I'm just going to call the view from 30,000 feet uh, here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a study that I uh, led for about 18 months for the U.S. National Science Foundation. <coughs> the SEED study, Science Engineering Art and Design, um, which looked at how this community of practice goes about collaborating and the kind of problems it runs into, and maybe the beginnings of some of the best practices that are beginning to emerge uh, in these kinds of communities that bridge uh, these very different um, ways of knowing. Never missed me. 
Um, two years ago, I made a major career break. For 30 work years, I worked as an astrophysicist. My last job was the director of an observatory. Um, I'm a specialist in uh, complicated optical systems. Two years ago, I moved to a totally new job, and I started a new lab uh, last November called the Artsci Lab at UT Dallas. And I want to tell you uh, about three works in progress. We've only been working on them for about three, four months. Um, but I'm very excited uh, about them. Um, and they involve working on data from astronomy, which is my home discipline, geosciences. Uh, we're working with a geoscience professor. Texas has more geologists than most uh, countries on the planet. Um, <laughs> the most studied geology of the planet. It's the home of fracking <laughs> at the moment. Uh, lots of things to do. And then a connectome brain data, uh, brain data set. Um, and so what I'm interested in is really looking at other ways of working with data. I work with data all my professional life. I ran a huge uh, NASA satellite operation with 30 programmers and data analysts and pipelines. <coughs> so um, data's in my gut. Um, but I do feel that as we work with these very different kinds of data sets and very large data sets sometimes, um, we kind of need to develop uh, agile ways of, of working with, with, with these kinds of data. And so that's going to be the <coughs> I'm going to be working on. And in particular, right now, we've started on how to augment uh, some of the data analysis tools with sonification devices, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit about publishing. I won't talk about it today. Uh, I'm the executive editor of a, um, some publications at MIT Press, the Leonardo Journal, Leonardo Music Journal, and we have a book series. Um, We've been publishing for about 47 years now. Um, we've published the work of about 20,000 people like you, people whose work bridges the sciences and the arts, or uh, sciences and humanities. Um, and I'm really interested in how a community of practice like this one, how we go about documenting our work and showing it to other people. Um, and that is a rapidly changing thing. Uh, I don't know how much time you spend on your cell phone in the last 24 hours, but we are developing different ways of interacting with other people and reading uh, information. And so I call it experimental publishing and knowledge curation because my guess is 40 years from now, we will look back at this period and like the Gutenberg period of the printing press, which was, of course transformed uh, scholarly publishing in a major way. Um, so let me just start from the, the view from 30,000 feet. And I'm going to do something with a little bit of trepidation. Um, um, I'm going to pretend I'm in New Guinea, I guess. <laughs> My culture is scientific culture. I grew up with a father that was a scientist and an engineer. Our family values. Science was a uh, valuable uh, uh, ethic. Um, and that's so deeply embedded in me that it's very hard for me to deny that that is my culture. Um, and um, I'm going to do two things which Michael has heard me do before. But my 16-year-old son made me say, I'm an atheist. And let me tell you, when my 16-year-old son came to me and said, Dad, are you agnostic or an atheist? I said, well, I never really thought about that very much. And finally, through those discussions with my son, I said, yes, I'm an atheist, and I'm proud to be an atheist. Um, and everybody's feeling a little bit uncomfortable in the room right now, because <laughs> this is normally what you talk about outside of work. You tend not to socialize with people don't sh that don't share that value. <laughs> um, so he actually started a club of atheists in his university, and they had coming out day. Um, <laughs> well, in, Ameri in American universities, let me tell you, <laughs> it takes courage to say you're an atheist. Um, and the other thing, which I'm not going to defend as much as I'm a positivist, it's 
Stop smiling, Michael. <laughs> I believe there is a world that exists independent of our trying to understand it. Um, and I know there are ways of knowing in the humanities which challenge that very deeply. Uh, and so, you know, I, I did the exercise with the fire extinguisher yesterday. Um, I believe there is a world that exists independent of our trying to understand it. Um, and um, what can I do? That's part of my values. That's part of what I believe in. But I think as, as scientists, you try to work with people in different ways of knowing. Uh, it's good to actually go back to some of those um, things. I mean, I can't justify either one of those using the scientific method. <laughs> They're cultural values that I acquired from my family environment and my reading and interacting with people. But as I go about problem solving, I cannot deny that it affects how I choose which problems I work on and what solutions I consider acceptable solutions. So um, yesterday I explained that the sciences are heterogeneous, and I'll, I'll go into that. Um, just one comment is people tend to talk about the scientific method as if it's the Bible. It's one of these static objects that you read and you apply it. Well, the scientific method itself uh, has actually evolved over the last 300 years. Um, and uh, as I said yesterday, and I'll show it again in the slide, um, different sciences actually put a different emphasis on different parts of the scientific method. And so I do believe we need to be a little bit uh, careful what is accepted as a valid explanation changes, and I, I, I don't have time to get go into, into that. As I said yesterday, uh, I think we're badly designed to design to understand the universe. And of course, one of the wonderful things about the cognitive sciences is they're on the front lines <laughs> of whether we can actually understand the universe using the human brain. So we're in the right place. Um, so I, I showed these yesterday, I don't want to go uh, into them more. I, I think the question of causality is, is one that is worth talking about. We had a little bit of a discussion with someone during the, the reception last night of where description becomes prediction, um, what is the nature of an explanation. Um, and I think as you go into some of these difficult questions in the cognitive sciences, uh, it's, it's good to be self-reflective uh, occasionally uh, on that question. Um, I'm an instrument builder. I go about understanding the world by building new instruments. I find it profoundly unsettling that there are some things I can't know until I invent the right instrument. It's kind of weird, right? There are some things I cannot know until I invent the right instrument. Um, and you now that means that science and engineering have this holy alliance. Um, and of course, in the cognitive sciences, I feel like astronomy was in the 1970s. You're inventing a new instrument every three years to study the human brain. And then you start finding out things you didn't know about. Um, and so this, this um, as human beings, we privilege the human senses and the human body. On the other hand, to understand the world, I think we have to give equal weight to instruments. And, and that is, um, I, I think, just a, a fact. Um, we're all going through what's called the big data transition. Um, some of you will get jobs in that industry. Um, astronomy went through this in the 1970s. Um, when I was a graduate student, you could get a PhD by studying one star or one galaxy. Uh, if you go look at a PhD in astronomy today, typically you're studying 100 million galaxies. <laughs> um, so astronomy went digital very early. Um, and my friend Daniel Boston, who was a historian of technology in the US Library of Congress, joked uh, that we had gone from a meaning rich, rich culture to where there was data poor to a data rich and meaning poor culture. Now that has, you know, it's a little bit glib written that way, but he just made the point, if you go to Darwin's house, which is not very far from here, every, all his data fit in a bookcase on his notebooks. I mean, everything he could get to try and understand human e uh, evolution and evolution fit in a series of books. 
Um, you now have access to so much data that the problem is trying to make sense of the data that someone else took for you uh, that you maybe didn't take yourself. Uh, and it's, it's actually a, a difficult problem not to be misled by, by your data. And so um, it, it's really understanding the nature of your but the data and the biases that are in it is, is really an important thing. Um, okay, one of the activities uh, going on at UT Dallas is led by my colleague Max Sheesh, who's a historian of art. Uh, and basically the big data revolution is, is coming to uh, the social sciences and humanities. The last five years we've been doing an annual symposium on the earth's humanities and complex networks. So actually it's people in cultural studies and social studies analyzing data they have using the same network analysis tools that cognitive scientists are using to study the brain. Uh, and so there's a lot of really interesting work going on uh, unpacking uh, cultural uh, thing, uh, questions. Um, and I'd like to say that cultural behavior has become an observational science. So um, it's, a, it's a really exciting time because there's a whole new field being born. Um, Google these words sometime. These are the words we're <coughs> arguing about um, in our discussion groups. Nomothetic is the activity of finding patterns in laws and phenomena, which is, of course, what scientists tend to do. Ipsitive, idiothetic, or idiographic is looking at the singular experience. So indeed, if you're going to write a biography of Winston Churchill, you're probably not you're going to use graph theory. Uh, you're going to try and understand Winston Churchill and his times, the cultural history of that period, the decisions he made, and what influenced the decisions he made. And clearly, that is a different way of, make, of knowing. Uh, I don't think you're going to understand Winston Churchill using complex network theory. On the other hand, many phenomena you can study and find patterns in and hopefully uh, predict uh, future behavior. One of the problems in the big data area is what, what I call the look back problem. We know what every 16 year old did two weeks ago. We know a little about what 16 year olds did a year ago. We know nothing about what 16 year olds did 100 years ago. <laughs> and so as you go back in time, we have less and less data about human activities. And so uh, uh, in the social sciences, there's a very large problem which is we study the present because we have the data, but what 16 year olds were doing in 1622, we don't have a clue because they did not live, leave uh, written traces of their activities. Um, the comparison that we make at UT Dallas is that this cultural science, clearly in, bio, in, uh, in human biology, you still do anatomy. That is still a totally valid way of studying and understanding the human body, but systems biology accompanies an anatomy. And so in the same way, in the cultural sciences, um, we think uh, there's an emergence of what might be called systems uh, culture analysis. Okay, so that, that was 30,000 feet and redoing the slides from yesterday. Um, one of the things um, that I spent a lot of time on is working on a study funded by the US National Science Foundation on a study which is published online as the seed study. If you Google SEAD in my name, you'll find it. Uh, the National Science Foundation started getting proposals from schools of art and design that were every bit as impressive and fundable as from the best scientific universities in America. And so they were trying to figure out what the hell was going on with schools of urban design, developing software packages, the kind of thing that, that uh, James was describing, pushing the state of the, of the art in the engineering <coughs> fields. Uh, and so the NSF was very interested in looking at the, this community of practice. And so um, we set up a working group. We did an international uh, poll. We tried to do this in a proto-collaborative way. It turned out to be really difficult. We received 54 full papers, a lot of meta-analyses, we read 35 prior reports on the subject of how to enable interdisciplinary collaboration. So a lot of people have been thinking about the problem. 
we had 320 suggested actions, some of which were fun me and no solve the problem. Uh, some of them were more useful, which I'll talk about. And then uh, as we looked at all this material, we found some patterns. Uh, I'm not an astronomer, so I look for patterns. Uh, and we identified 13 processes which we thought really were worth discussing uh, in terms of best practices for interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and um, I'm just going to go through these very quickly, um, but there's, there's a lot of documentation in the report. <coughs> Translating. We all agreed really quickly yesterday that that fire extinguisher was red. <laughs> Um, but as soon as you start collaborating with people, there are all kinds of misunderstandings that arise very, very quickly because you may use the same word, but in your culture, it's semantically linked with other words that are different from the other person's. So when I say music and you say music, it may diverge very quickly. Now, John Cage was an amazing musician <laughs> in my culture but maybe not in your culture. And so actually investing the time, and it's difficult, in looking at the concepts and words we're using together and making sure that we don't have fundamental misunderstandings from the get-go. Uh, and the trouble is that takes time and effort and work. Um, and sometimes we'll have to agree to disagree, right? I mean, sometimes it is impossible to translate what is the language in New Guinea <laughs> to English. I mean, there are certain concepts which are not translatable because they're culturally situated concepts that, are, that don't exist uh, in the other culture. And that's the same between art and science or design and humanities and so on. So uh, it sounds trivial, but many collaborations have broken down because people had really deep misunderstandings even though they were using the same words. Convening. Um, this little thing that Sue's doing, where we're going to meet three times a year for the next three years, amazingly important because otherwise people don't meet people who aren't like that. You probably know that on the internet there are all these studies now on what's called homophily, but internet groups are more segregated than social groups. People tend to friend people like them. Uh, and when you get friend requests, just be, look at what you do. <laughs> you know, how many friend requests from Africa did you accept this week? Right? And so I get friend requests from students all over the planet, and I tend to hesitate. Uh, so convening and actually getting people that don't think the same way together is really crucial uh, and difficult. And, and as Cargovo works in the coming years, it's going to be a real challenge to invest the time in actually hashing out uh, things which you cannot do by, by email. Uh, enabling safe places, this little room, that little section of uh, office space out there, is an amazingly precious uh, real estate. So many collaborations fall apart because they don't have a safe place to work. They get attacked immediately because it's stupid, it's crazy. Uh, and so uh, safe places where people who are trying to do something risky can work is really important for these kinds of collaborations. Including, um, not only do scientists tend to cluster with scientists and artists with artists, uh, but we tend to cluster with people of the same ethnic background, of the same cultural language background. The fact that Cognovo has hit people from 15 countries is a huge asset, right? I mean, that is going to be a disturbing uh, value, uh, but it will challenge, uh, and people that come from Turkey will challenge things for the people that come from Malaysia, say. And I think that's really important in, in collaboration, that diversity uh, should be viewed as an asset and, and not a problem. Embedding. Um, I was delighted yesterday that we, we started off with the people in the industrial world talking about their view of things. Um, Helga Novotny calls this social embedding. Uh, so often uh, scientific research is done disconnected from the societal realities that we all live in. 
And so how you actually uh, embed the questions we're asking in the companies, the organizations, the groups that uh, hopefully what we come up with is going to be useful for, the sooner that happens, the better. Um, and so uh, it, and I think Carnova has done the right, right thing in including and the government language is all the stakeholders <laughs> uh, in, in, in from, from the beginning. Situating. The voodoo lounge is not irrelevant. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. um, often, you know, innovative activities happen in places where normal social <coughs> culture ha habits don't exist. Um, and so um, universities tend to be very conservative, and, and it's really good to go into hacker and making communities where suddenly things are going off in some different direction at a rate of speed that is impossible in universities. And so exploiting um, what I'm calling alternative spaces here is, is a, a really good uh, method. Sense making, I'm going to talk about it here because the cognitive sciences were featured as a key investment in terms of understanding uh, collaboration. Documenting and transmitting, we're going to talk about that uh, tomorrow because indeed how a community of practice, you know, we tend to publish in different journals. You know, astronomers don't publish in the same journals as chemists and so on. So how we actually each, uh, develop uh, knowledge together uh, is, is something that takes uh, takes work. Learning, I won't go into. Um, we were distressed to find how little training there is on how to be a good collaborator. Um, and if any of you has taken a course of, in how to be a good collaborator, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. What was yours? Of course, I um, I worked with consensus. It was consensus building. Okay. Someone else took a course in collaboration. What was yours? We are studying a lot of social psychology and collaboration is key. In and I took, I took courses at NASA, which was on uh, collaboration between scientists, engineers, and administrators. <laughs> um, but in fact, most collaboration courses are for, for close communities of people who know who think the same way. But when you start talking about a dancer, a computer scientist, and a cognitive scientist, how you train people to collaborate is, it, it's, I think, is an under, uh, under-invested area. And finally, um, the pleasure, the pleasure principle. Um, you know, we're working on these things because we think they're exciting and fun and important, um, and uh, so often those the, those get to be hidden. Um, Questions of ethics and values, but also just let me let me tell you, if you're going home and it's not been the most exciting thing you all did all day, well, stop doing that PhD to someone else. <coughs> um, anyway, so um, so that was that that report, and I, I think um, we tend to underestimate how difficult it is to collaborate with people that aren't in your exact same discipline. And it takes real investment of time. Uh, and methodology, um, and so you know, I'm hoping to work with Sue over the coming three years to see how we use best practices uh, in, in the way that the Cardinal Book develops. How am I doing on time? Ten. Okay, so now I'm going to just switch to what my lab has been doing. Um, so, um, as I said, right now we've chosen to work on an area that I felt competent in, I've analyzed data all my life, data exploration, data representation, and three weeks ago, another said, well, you're really doing data dramatization. I said, that's fine. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there are acts and chapters, and let's work on that. Um, from the beginning, I set ourselves the challenge of working with data from different disciplines. Normally, astronomers analyze astronomy data, cognitive scientists analyze cognitive science data, and geoscientists analyze geoscientist data. We're going to actually um, work with data sets and the scientists across those areas. We're interested in finding, as I said, agile ways of exploring data that doesn't rely on 30 years of data, of data visualization. Um, and so we're, we're going to try and develop some new tools, I'll show you some directions. From the beginning, we've said that in this lab, we're going to have multiple outputs. 
with, with, if you're going to make it health or evaluation committees, who evaluates this place? I don't know. Um, and normally you count the number of publications, the number of patents, <laughs> the number of exhibitions. Well, we're going to have multiple outputs. Um, we're going to show our scientific work in artistic venues and be criticized because it's boring. Uh, and nobody wants to sit with it for more than six minutes. Um, we're going to develop tools that we want both scientists and artists to use. And let me tell you, as, as tool designers, the designer in the room will tell you have different ways of designing tools. We have a small technology test bed that we're beginning to play with some uh, nano technologies. And then uh, we're trying to set up an environment um, which has multiple time scales and symmetrical roles. So often in these collaborations, and it's difficult in all collaborations, uh, there, are, there are people that take dominant uh, positions in terms of defining the agenda. And so we're going to try and make sure that the artists and the scientists um, are paid the same amount of money per month. That's already a challenge in a lot of universities. Um, uh, but also that uh, as we design these collaborations, uh, we don't privilege one way of knowing over the other un unless we understand why. So the first data set we're working on is uh, astronomy data. It's from a friend of mine, Li Fan Wang, uh, who's a Chinese scientist, and he has a robotic telescope in Antarctica. Uh, this is when they were setting it up, and now they're not there. The telescope runs four months a year during Antarctic night, taking images of the sky, but they have big data. Uh, they have hundreds of thousands of stars that they're tracking minute by minute. Um, and he's given us access to this data to, to see what we can do with it. Um, and so hopefully... Okay, so I'm Roger Molina. Uh, I'm an astronomer, um, but also a professor of technology here at UT Dallas. And we're about to present to you uh, a project we're working on with Ruth West at the University of North Texas and Alejandro Bohani. And here at uh, UTD, uh, Andrew Blanton, who's going to explain what you're going to see, Scott Gresham Lancaster. Uh, and we're working on sonifying uh, scientific data as a data exploration tool. The data that's being used here uh, is from a colleague of ours, Li Fan Wang, who's at Texas A&M University. And he has a telescope, a robotic telescope, which is sitting in Antarctica as we speak. And it basically takes data for four months at a time during the Antarctic night. And so we're, we're working with this very large data set. And what I like to say is we're doing things to the data that no self-respecting scientist would ever do. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, who's going to show you where we are at developing this data exploration tool. So basically, um, one of the things that I was really interested in was how to take this data set and turn it into an instrument or a uh, piece of artwork. Um, and so uh, wirelessly, uh, I've created a small interface for the iPad, and using the actual pitch of the iPad, I can have control over volume, so I can turn uh, this data on. Um, we can also begin to spatialize uh, this data through different portions of the room um, through this interface, and that's a part of this idea of remix. So what happens when I have one sound and I can place it in one area of the room, another sound place into another area of the room? I can bring them together and mix them together in real time, uh, pass them around uh, through the room. So, um, the way we got these sounds... Uh, okay, let me just explain the data again. So, uh, the robotic telescope has an infrared camera, it's like watching a patch of sky, continuously <laughs> symmetrical. Then, there's a software that then extracts uh, individual stars from that data. So, in this case, is the brightness of a star that you can see is oscillating. This is four months worth of data, so it's a very slow uh, oscillation. Um, but we have hundreds of thousands of these data sets. Yeah, and so I took this uh, longer data set and I assigned this basically to a bank of oscillators and started reading through it. Um, and then I took that uh, and stretched it out by about a thousand times. And that gave me this uh, lower, deeper, almost like a choral sounding uh, voice to me. Um, and then we took also the same data set and we took the raw binary data from that uh, and we basically put a cap on it on each side and called it a wave file and played it so we can listen to the peculiar sets of, uh, of differences in the binary data also, which is, which is interesting. So I think you're going to...
Okay, so the, the second data set um, is the geosciences data. We, we've got all kinds of data from the sinus, LIDAR data, seismic data. The oil company wants us to sonify oil wells and figure out whether successful wells sound differently from unsuccessful <laughs> wells. Uh, so maybe that will be a nice lucrative contract. Um, we, we, I'm just going to show you um, the, 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 the geology data um, and what we've started doing with it. Um. Okay, hi, I'm Scott Gresham Lancaster, one of the associate researchers here uh, at the Art Science Lab at the University of Texas in Dallas. We're working on several different projects uh, related to multimodal representation, uh, which would be the combination of both sonification and visualization. In this case, it's working with uh, Carlos, Dr. Carlos Aiken in the uh, geoscience department here. Um, and what we've done is taken uh, the map of Texas, which you can see the outline here, uh, that shows the uh, layers of sediment to 15 meters uh, on the surface of uh, the state itself. And the idea is to most sonifications and most representations of things uh, that, that deal with sound are done in a, a way that uh, goes across time, so that your progression of the information across time. This is a different kind of take where we're uh, displaying all of the, inf the potential information and it's up to the user to decide where to investigate. So I have to change the mode here so the outline of the state of Texas will go away. And we will go to actually playing this as if it was a gong. So I'll turn it on, and all the various types of sediment, so this would be more of a, a sedimentary layer of sandstone. And so they all have a little different timbre based on uh, what the, and so this is metamorphic rock in here. It's much uh, denser, so it has a, has a different kind of quality. This is a uh, fully metamorphic uh, granite, so uh, you can sort of investigate and also listen to the, the change in the frosted. Uh, <laughs> okay, the third data set is from Gabe and who's a brain scientist, and there'll be people here who understand the connectome data better than, than I do. Uh, but it's been really a delightful collaboration that was actually triggered by Cardovo, so I started looking around who I could work with on campus. Um, and, um... Hi, my name is Doug and Blake. I'm an assistant professor of behavioral and brain sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm interested in brain networks and how they change over age. Um, and I've been collaborating with Roger Molina, Andrew Blanton, Scott Gresham Lancaster and Max Sheep on a project where we're trying to uh, investigate and understand brain networks and visualize um, them using different uh, techniques. Um, so what you're about to see um, are initial steps towards um, understanding um, brain networks as characterized by patterns of resting state connectivity. Um, and you move on. Yeah. So uh, what we've done here is that basically we've taken uh, Goggin provided us with uh, 391 uh, important areas of the brain and uh, the connections between those areas. So we've made a visualization of those uh, that moves its uh, real-time um, animation of the data set. Uh, and we've also taken the connections from the visual points and we've sonified those connections based on the weight of the connection. So, uh, each one of these, um, I can populate these data sets in real time. Which here. Yeah. And we can start to begin to see like the complex interaction between these three of the 391 nodes that we're representing. Um, I can also uh, build these all completely at once. So, A representation of the full data set. Okay, so we've, we've not made any scientific discoveries yet, uh, but maybe next time I come we will have.
So the idea is just to work with these three scientists developing different kinds of tools uh, to go through the data in different ways. So my ad count. So, um, I will stop there. So um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea of what we're working on. Um, but also the collaboration theory that I'm trying to use to inform how we go about doing things. Thank you very much. Two very short questions. Um, the first one, for the solidification, did you use pure data or max MSP? Yeah, max MSP, but uh, both of the, both, uh, both Scott and Andrew uh, happen to be, they're both musicians, but also software developers. Uh, and so I keep restraining them from using, developing their own software. Yeah. <laughs> and so yes, we've been using max MSP, but also um, a number of other toolkits. Um, one of the things we want to do is to develop uh, tools that then we'll put a, a, online for open access. Uh, and there's a fair amount of that there already. Uh, second short question about positivism. Uh, you already said that you, um, to, in order to understand or in order to discover what you're seeing out there, uh, you need to build instruments, right? So if you just drop the assumption that there's something out there, um, and you need to build instruments to understand, um, you're already on the way to constructivism, aren't you? Yes, I mean, the, what it means is that what human beings need know at a given moment in time depends on the history of instrument building over the last 3,000 years. And so clearly what we know today uh, has a socially influenced component. So the fact that during the Second World War, radar was developed and certain technologies and the semiconductor came out of the space race and so on, that pushed scientific knowledge in a certain direction because certain instruments could be invented and not others, right? And so if, if we were a different civilization on another planet, science would probably take a different path. But I believe we would agree uh, that the hydrogen atom has a certain structure and that their science and our science would cover the same conclusion, right? Now, the problem gets when you get to much more complicated scientific things than the structure of the hydrogen atom. A thousand years from now, will we have a different concept of, of how uh, something is designed or functions or the laws that govern it? And so that's where you also have to buy into that the scientific method is, is always provisional, right? It's subject to revision. But that doesn't mean the hydrogen atom is socially constructed, in my view. <laughs> <laughs> um, liked what you said. Stop it, Martha. Giggling <laughs> <laughs> in the back of the room. You think the hydrogen atom is socially constructed? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my God. <laughs> um, liked what you said about um, the importance of recreation. And there's a series of meetings in my field where one afternoon is always spent on a long hike, and it completely gets around the problem of only picking choosing to talk to the people who share your views because you talk to people who walk at the same speed that you do. Um, and some of that, and there are people here that have worked on creativity theory, right? And so clearly toggling between different kinds of activities is a typical way that you, you get out of being locked into a certain sort of bed end or, or whatever. And now different people do that in different ways. Uh, and so there's no magic recipe, I, I, I think. I mean, I don't know whether in Singapore I would recommend that all science students learn dance. Maybe. <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, it's sort of an interesting question of how different people, and this is where it becomes embodied, right? I mean, clearly different people enjoy different things, um, and so and that is a singular, uh, singular thing. So, um, and but but I think one one of the important points the scientists that that the interview didn't view that as recreation. Right. They, they, they viewed those activities as part of how they had ideas. Um, and whereas the less successful scientists used to say, well, I wish I worked in the office longer. Mm -hmm. uh, wrong answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I know two questions. Uh, one is a very general question, and one is a bit specific. The general question is, you said you're hoping to have a scientific discovery in the next time you come. And how how you how you see that the metrics can help with that? Because one of the things that struck me is kind of how different. Because we usually see our data and have see patterns and make 
assumption. But if we, if we don't hear the data and make an assumption of how it would be differently make theories based on how we listen to it. So I'm wondering how you how you're thinking of Okay, so um, for a number of years we ran an art science residency in Marseille, in, in the south of France, where artists would come in to work with local scientists. Uh, I have one example of a scientific discovery made, it, made as a result of one of those collaborations. Now, it's not going to be a Nobel Prize, but it was really concrete and it was really fun. So this was a young digital artist uh, from Chile, um, uh, Xavier Tejerina, and she was working with a hydrodynamic scientist that works on water, we have water tanks here, and he did computer modeling of water, water phenomena. They were working together. She wanted to make an installation. He wanted to make, improve his computer simulation. And they observed a wave that nobody had ever observed before in the history of hydrodynamics. It had a phase velocity and a speed and an amplitudes that nobody had ever seen before. So they've now written a little paper together where the artist and the scientist say, we found this wave, he's now modeled it, and so you know, he discovered how to, how to model it. Now, maybe he would have made that discovery anyway, I don't know. But let me tell you, when they came out for drinks that evening and said, we made a discovery today, <laughs> uh, it, you know, and it was the artist and the scientist with their different goals in life who said, gee, this was amazing, this was you know, a really good day. <laughs> so, you know, and that is, classic creativity theory, right? Which is sometimes someone who's a little bit less informed than you uh, may notice things that you have long ago decided not to pay attention to. And so uh, that, that's not unusual and, and you know, that, that can happen in different kind of ways, not only through art science interaction. But uh, so you know, the hope is with these kinds of interdisciplinary uh, collaborations that we create the conditions for that to happen. Um, that doesn't mean we're gonna get Nobel Prizes. <clears throat> oh, I was wondering whether the, um, the people who are making the visualization had built the instruments that got the data that they were then using to work with. Well, so I'm curious about that connection. Well, you we came in late in the process for these three. The, um, the scientist, the Chinese scientist um, who uh, had the data from Antarctica from the telescope, he actually led the team that built the telescope. So he was both the instrument maker and the data analysis guy. Now, just referring to one of the things that came up yesterday, he has a very large data set. I mean, if you leave one of these big telescopes running continuously for four months, you fill a lot of this space. Uh, and in fact, you know, Antarctica has very bad internet connection, and so they, a lot of it they carry back by hand because it's difficult to transmit back. Um, um, he throws away 99.9% .9 of his data, right? He's looking for very specific things. He has pipelines going through, looking for those very specific things. And the rest of the data he just puts in the trash, right? So we're going to be analyzing his trash. So it's like second-hand data? Because I'm kind it's of second -hand data. about data that you just use, which you didn't originate, okay. and the stuff that you but that, that, some of your data. But that gets into a, a, an interesting best practice question. So um, with Gagan, We've been trying to figure out what problem he's trying to solve, right? Because the danger with second-hand data is you won't know, you know where the interesting problems are in the data. And so we're in, actually interested in working with the scientists who took the data to understand what it is that they're trying to figure out. And, and, and so we're trying to you know, situate our work in the context of why the, that data was taken. So um, and obviously you can take second-hand data and not know, you can misinterpret it, misanalyze it, and, Cognitive sciences. I know smaller groups with nothing of the scale of what's going on here. Um, in, in other fields, and the, 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 the really good news which kind of came out of the, the study we did is there is a lot of work going on, right? And so, um, 
you know, every time I go to Brazil, I have my mind blown <laughs> because this interdisciplinary work going on there in, in very un unlikely places. So, um, uh, my colleague there is going back to Srishti in Bangalore, where there's some really unusual work going on. Um, so, um, if, if you look at the international landscape, there's a lot of investment. Now, some of that is government driven, and so. The city of Dallas wants to be a creative community. <laughs> we have low rent, <laughs> and so let's fund interdisciplinary collaboration, right? So the, the creative community movement has been very helpful uh, because the creativity to innovation to economic development, even though the guys left who said startup companies are irrelevant to economic development, has in fact means that, that as you go around the world right now, there's a lot of interest in provoking these kinds of mixtures of, of scientists, people in the arts and humanities design. Um, so um, certainly in the cognitive sciences, but you, you would know better. I don't know a thing of the scale of Cognovo that's being tried right now. and simplicity of the data which we talk about data. So the reason I ask you a question is because I'm a system reviewer and we sometimes do kind of put all of this data together to answer a question for a clinician. And then they have a lot of discussion how generalizable it is to them. And they kind of make assumption with contextual information. But actually the contextual information was in the primary data and we simplified them to not going it. So somehow when it's trying to be researched it kind of the richness gets lost. And, how you kind of connect back to it? So, so that, that's the classic creativity question about drilling deep, right? And so my dad said, <laughs> you can be a physicist first and a poet second, but you can't be a poet first and a physicist second, right? <laughs> so you've got to drill deep <laughs> and then use that to... So indeed, there's a danger... You know, we, we could spend all our time analyzing parts of the data that we find fascinating, but has absolutely... A, it's noise, I mean, let's not get into that discussion that we started getting into yesterday, but um, I mean, indeed the danger is that, you know, the sinus is very goal-oriented, right? So they're, they're, many of them are hypothesis-driven, but not all scientists work that way. I mean, there are different ways of making scientific discoveries, but when you are hypothesis-driven, not only do you throw away the data that's irrelevant to testing or hypothesis, but you're not going to waste time analyzing things that keep you from making you know, the, the, those conclusions. So you know, uh, the danger is we will get fascinated by stuff in the day that, that is an artifact of the instrument. I mean, you know, I, in my previous talks, I always say every instrument I build hallucinates. It, it creates artifacts in the data which you know, <laughs> the instrument created, just like human beings. Um, so you had, you had, you know, between very goal-oriented data analysis, and, and that's what Lifan is with his pipelines, right? I mean, he is looking for very specific things in his data, and he's not interested if there's a butterfly flying through the picture at the time, you know, and there shouldn't be any butterflies in Antarctica. <laughs> so he would throw away the, the, the butterfly because it's irrelevant to his astronomical discovery. <coughs> Final question over there. Oh, I just wanted to ask whether you could share the reports that you mentioned. Or if, if you Google S E A D Molina, you'll find that it's unfortunately it's about 400 pages because we included. Right. But this is an executive summary. Yeah. S E A D and Molina, and you'll find find it online. And maybe the name of the the people that made the scientific discovery about um, the waveform as well. So uh, uh, Xavier Tejerina was the artist, uh, and um, the scientist is that wonderful? I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> Because I know his name in French, but not in English, so um, uh, I can't remember his name. But Tejerina, T-E-J-E-R-I-N-A. Thank you.